Well, good morning, North Life. If you are joining us online, I just want to welcome you to a, uh, an exciting morning in the Word of God and, uh, and a big shout, a big hello to Ryan Lander. I'm usually with you uh, in those chairs, but I'm here on the screen. I'm usually watching the video with you, but now I'm right here. And uh, I'll just be honest with you, it's Thursday right now. But uh, it's Sunday morning where you're at, and I realize that we are so bound by time and uh, bound by geography. But here's what's not bound. God's word. God's word is not bound, and I know that he is there with you right now, that he is moving in your midst, and that he is wanting to do a powerful work in each of your lives. And so with that reality, uh, if you believe that, if you're with me in that, just leaning in this morning, saying, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. That's what I want. I realize that he's here. Would you just do something with me? Would you, would you just take a deep breath and, uh, and just open your hands up and, and repeat with me, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Let's do that one more time. Just open your hands up, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. All right, we've just invited him into this, and I will be checking with Pastor Justin to see if any of you jumped in on that. But uh, with that in mind, let's pray, and we'll dig into God's word. Father, we are uh, just so uh, realistically humbled by the opportunity we have to enter into a conversation with you and to know that you are with us, the living God uh, in our midst, and that you are prepared to open our hearts up and to pour into us. And I pray that that would happen, and I pray that we would be transfixed and transformed even right now. And I pray that, Lord, you would help me to get out of the way so that we would see Jesus. And it's in his powerful name, our Savior's name, that I pray. Amen. All right, we are in John chapter 14, and we're picking up in verse 18. So we are like in the middle of this bigger passage, and we're just honing in on a few verses, 18 through 24 today. And uh, before we grab that, I, what I'd like to do is just sort of pull the lens back and remind us of, of what's happening, what's going on, because it's so easy to sort of lose the forest for the trees when we're taking it piece by piece. But recall just... Uh, a couple of days ago, there was this massive parade, and Jesus is being celebrated, he's being sung over, and the disciples are there, and they're kind of walking behind him, they're the entourage, and they're like, yeah, you know, we, yeah, we're somebody, we're kind of important, we're his disciples, you know, they're, they're all in there, in the mix, and the anticipation of what's coming is huge, and so just after that, we find ourselves at Passover, and Passover is something that they had been doing since they were kids, a really familiar space. And probably they're just a little bit chill there. They're, they're a little bit subdued because Jesus is in the room. Um, but inside of them, you just got to recognize, like inside of them, it was like um, last week, Saturday, before King Charles is being coronated in England, like the whole country is amped to thinking about Hey, uh, just what's going to happen when King Charles, what's it going to look like? And sort of looking forward to that. And the, the guys inside are actually just sitting there waiting for Jesus to be crowned king. That's their anticipation. They're looking forward to that moment. They're hoping that, that I mean, that's why we're in Jerusalem after all, isn't it? That, that Jesus is going to be king and that they will be part of this inner circle of the king. He's going to kick Rome out. He's going to take the throne of Israel and then everything will be perfect for them. That's in their minds. That's what's going on in their hearts. And it's amazing because Jesus is in the opposite end of the pool. He is hours away from arrest, from his death. He recognizes that the guys that are there are going to be full of fear, that, that everything about the life that they thought they had is going to be shattered in a moment, that, that they will have an amazing amount of sorrow that their hearts will be broken, that they will be bewildered and alone in that moment. That he just senses that, that their hearts will be sorrowful. And chapter 13 actually says that Jesus was troubled in his spirit as a result of this. And so he's, he's coming in from a completely different direction than the disciples are as they're gathered. And, and it's in that that he just goes, guys, I'm leaving. I'm not going to be here like this anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm going back to the Father. And you just sense that the guys are like, 
wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on here for a second, Jesus. That doesn't fit our one and three year vision plan for this kingdom movement. Like that is sort of outside of where we were headed. And I don't know if you've ever experienced that in your life where you've had everything figured out. Um, Step by step, your entire life is, is, is set for you. You've got it all ahead. And you know what everything is going to look like, where everything is going. And then in one phone call, in one text, in one diagnosis, in one moment where papers are filed, your life is shattered. Everything is blown apart. It's like you're driving and you take a left turn off the cliff. That's where these guys are at. They're scrambling to try to understand what Jesus begins to pour out into their lives. And that's really from 13 through into 16. That's what Jesus is doing. It's just one conversation. He's pouring into them because he desires them to be comforted, to be, to be strengthened, to be encouraged, to be built up, to, to be able to say, look, I know it's dark now, but, but there's light ahead. I know it's going to be tough for a little bit, but better is coming. This is what Jesus is doing. The guys, they're receiving it, and they're trying to understand it physically. They're trying to understand it in an intellectual way, in a, in a, in a sensory way. And Jesus is speaking next level into the lives. He's speaking spiritually. And he's trying to anchor and ground them at, at a whole nother level. It's, it's this space and this conversation that we find ourselves just in this little snippet from verse 18 through 24. So let me read that. Verse 18 says this, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not the world? And Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. We just recognize that John is writing this like 60 years after Jesus spoke these words. Like he's writing this on the other side of the cross, on the other side of the resurrection, the ascension, on the other side of Pentecost, where the Spirit comes in and dwells the church. John is writing with a much fuller understanding of what Jesus is setting down here. And we, too, understand in a much fuller way, because not only are we with John and all of that, but we are with John having the fullness of Scripture before us and a sensing of the width of what Jesus is communicating. So it's in that context, kind of in that width, that like, I want to just make sure that we get a hold of it in the day and age that we're in. And so I want to do this in a different way. Lay out three things. First, this marvelous indwelling of God. Second, three promises that are tied to that indwelling. And the third is this statement, which probably none of us miss, it sort of sticks out there. It, it, it reads like this. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. That, that's there. That's real. My wife would say, that's just so black and white. It's black and white. Like, um, I'm going to push that a little bit. We'll look at the indwelling and the promises and use that kind of as a ramp, hopefully, to wrap our heads around what Jesus is actually communicating. So indwelling, the indwelling of a person. Recall last week in uh, verse 17, in fact, let's just look there, verse 17, Josh unpacked for us these words that, he's, in 16 he says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. 
And Jesus is introducing them to the Holy Spirit in a whole new way. He's looking forward to Pentecost when the Spirit will descend and and become a permanent indwelling of every single believer, every single follower of Jesus Christ. He's looking ahead to that. We have the vantage point of looking back to that and recognizing that that happened. But that for every follower of Jesus Christ, every true believer, every person who has understood that they've sinned and that they've fallen short of the glory of God, that, that they've missed the mark, that there's somehow there's a separation between me and God that, that recognize that and confess and repent and turn from that sin. Like, turn to Jesus from that sin, to him from the way that I was living and begin to walk in a path toward Jesus, believing that his death on that cross was sufficient payment and that there is a movement of new life now available. That to every person, Jesus says, the Spirit will be in you. Like, in you. And listen, don't ever let the Scripture become dry. That should blow our minds. When you think about what's being said here, like, this is the the being, the Spirit, the one who hovered over the waters at creation, eternal, invincible, all-powerful, dwelling here. That, that's, that's hard to wrap my head around. I, I can't actually grab a hold of that. But that's what Jesus says, that for every believer, there is a permanent indwelling of the Spirit of God. He says the world won't have that because they won't believe. There's going to be a lot of people. There may be people this morning listening to this that don't actually have that Spirit of God dwelling in them because they haven't come to faith in Jesus Christ. But it's available. He's available. So, Josh mentioned that, brings that out. And in our text, look at verse 20 with me. It says, In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Jesus is talking. And he says, in that day, again, he's looking to Pentecost. We have the vantage point of looking back to that. But Jesus says, in that day. In other words, when the Holy Spirit descends, when the Holy Spirit indwells you, You're going to know. And that word is, uh, there's a couple of words in the Greek. That word is gnosko. It's uh, experiential knowledge. It's the the knowledge that is, is, is very different from like memorizing a recipe and then the knowledge that comes with actually cooking it and then eating it, tasting it. Like that's totally different knowledge. This is the kind of knowledge that you want a heart surgeon to have or um, an auto mechanic. Like, you don't want to show up at the hospital and and the guy who's going to cut on you says, hey, I just picked this scalpel up at Amazon. It had some really good reviews and I've watched this a couple times on YouTube. Like, that's not the the experience you want, right? You want the knowledge that, that they've been there, done that, seen the outcome, and that's what Jesus is saying here. I just want to spend a time, some minute on that because this is amazing. Jesus says that in that day, like, when the Spirit comes... You're going to know that the Father and the Son are one, that Jesus is in the Father. You're just going to know that. It's going to be something that you sense inside of you. That it's, it's a real, tangible understanding. And then he says this, and this is amazing. He says, and, and I in you and you in me. Like, Also, there's going to be this union, this uniting of Jesus and the believer. The Spirit coming, Jesus in us, we in him, this movement with Jesus, with the Spirit. And then there's this one other little thing in verse 23. The second half of it, it says this, And my Father will love him. And we, we, Jesus and the Father, will come to him and make our home with him. In this little bitty passage, there's a conversation about the triune God dwelling in every believer. That's absolutely unbelievable. I mean, mean, the reality of that, like, Just where you're sitting this morning, here, 
in your heart, if you've come to faith in Christ, in your heart, the triune God, the creator of the universe, the one who stands outside of time and space, this being who is beyond comprehension, says, has taken up residence spiritually in us. That's the reality. That's new creation conversation. That's new life conversation. But that is the reality, the experiential reality. And there's something inside that says, that's true. That's true. I know that. And Josh talked about it last week. It's like, you, you, there's words, but there's not words. There's, there's a way to explain it, but you can't explain it. But there's something real, legitimately there that says, yeah, I, he is. And I am. And we are. And they are. And, and we walk with this God through the course of our days. There's this place that like I, I don't even know how to explain it but I have talked with people over the years and, and there's been many times where I've just wanted to be, take my heart and set it into somebody's chest and say look feel this this is what it is this is true Jesus is who he says he is I, I've just wished I could give that to people but, but it needs to be experienced one by one, faith by faith, heart by heart. And, uh, and I just, I hope that, that for all, all of you who are listening, I hope that that is the reality of your life. It's that indwelling, that movement with the Spirit, with the triune God, that underpins these three promises that we see here. And they're subtle, but they're beautiful. And so just briefly, I want to touch on them. One of them is, is life, the promise of life. Look at verse 19. The second half of that says this, because I live, you also will live. Oh man, that's our great hope. Because I live, Jesus says, and he just says it like, because I live and I'm just always gonna live. Like there is a forever statement in what he says. Because I am always living. The, this is the, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. In him was life. And, and that, it's that conversation. It, this life, this um, eternal life, the life of the living God, the, the uh, source and sustainer of life is Jesus. And, and this life is a life that swallows up death. This life, Jesus says, because I live, you also will live. It's this union of us with his spirit, this indwelling of the spirit, the fusion of his life with our life that he gives his life to us that says we will live in the same way that he lives, which is forever. That's amazing. Hold on to that. That is a, a promise that carries us through everything that we bump into. When that left turn comes and that cliff shows up, this is an amazing promise. You will, I will live forever. Here's another one. The second one that shows up here just gently is that we are loved. We're loved. Uh, look at the second half of verse 21. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. I mean, to be loved by the living God, to be loved by Jesus, in verse 23 says this as well, and my father will love him. And that's true, and that's real. That's every day. To, to be loved by the living God, to be loved by Jesus, that, that's absolutely amazing. I don't know what your days look like. I don't know how isolated and alone you can feel even in the midst of a, of a church gathering. I don't know how many friends have uh, popped you off of Facebook. I don't know uh, if you get snaps. I don't know. I don't know. But here's what I know. I know that God loves you. That's what he's saying. If you are a follower of him, if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, the Father loves you in, in a way that is incomprehensible. And Jesus loves you. Every day, every moment, every breath. He, he never not loves you. And he loves you with the fullness of love that we can't even comprehend. That's a promise. That's a reality. It's, it's more than a promise. It's a reality. Our life is reality. 
this life we have now in him. The third is, is, is presence, a promise of presence, the reality of his presence in our lives. And that comes through the indwelling. And I just want to sort of remind us of that. Verse 18 says, I won't leave you as orphans. I won't leave you as orphans. I won't leave you alone. I'll come to you. And uh, that's amazing. That everywhere we go in life, every place we find ourselves in life, that, that God is with us. That he's right there. He's right here. And that he moves ahead of us. He shields us from the back. He's in us. He's with us. He surrounds us. Like, we walk through this life with the living God. And that's amazing. That's a reality that sometimes I forget. But this passage reminds me of that. That eternal life is mine. That I am loved, beloved by the living God. And that I have presence. His presence with me. I think all of that helps us to get a hold of the statement then that shows up in verses 21 through 23. Let me read it and we're going to tackle it. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And then Judas, not Iscariot, says to him, Lord, how is it that you manifest yourself to us? Like you're going to show yourself to us. You're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world. And Jesus answered him, and notice that he says the same thing he just said. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and he'll come to him, make her home with him. Jesus is, is saying, look, um, I will be there for anyone who loves me and keeps my commandments. I, I will be there. And we hear that, and, and I think... Often I hear that as a challenge. I hear that as a prick to my heart. I hear that as, as a place where I, I sort of enter into conviction. But understand that Jesus is actually saying this as an encouragement. These guys are about to be blasted by his death. And he's saying this to buoy them up. Remember, he's speaking to believers. He's speaking to those who have come into relationship with him. And who are about to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit. So this is encouragement. But also a little conviction, and I, I think we can touch on that and be okay with it. But I also want you to hear this. I want you to hear the freedom in what Jesus says. There's no obligation. There's no duty. There's no, there's no have to here. Jesus just says, love me or don't love me. Love me or don't love me. But how you relate to me the decision that you make in relation to me is the same decision that you're going to make in relation to my word. In other words, if you love me, you're also just going to love my word. If you don't love me, you're not going to love my word. If you love me, you're going to obey my word. If you don't love me, you won't obey my word. There's a freedom in that. There's a, there's a, a, a wondrous choice that we get to make. I think sometimes we walk into this thinking like, oh man, he's, he's forcing this upon us. And Jesus doesn't. That's the beauty of it. He offers so much, but he just says, you don't, you don't have to love me. You don't have to obey me. But for those who do, and that's the beauty of the conversation, for those who do. And this statement actually isn't new. Um, it's, it goes all the way back in the, Old, in the Old Testament, but it's actually part of how we're wired as human beings. We're actually wired this way. We, we actually live what we love, and we live what we believe. We live what we trust. That we don't even think about it. That's just how we operate. That's just how we live. We, we move through our life. You spend any amount of time with someone over the course of years, and you observe where they put their treasure, what they accumulate, the goals that they pursue, the way that they interact and relate with people, how they treat others, how they speak, how they act, and you're going to know pretty close what they love or who they love. And you're going to know what they believe or what they're trusting in or relying on. It's just the way that we live as humans. Jesus is just surfacing this. He's just saying, guys, for those who love me, keep my commands, I'm going to be there. And the other part of this, that I think one of the keys to understanding is that what Jesus is saying is that love and obedience is one conversation. It's not two. It's not... Uh, 
all right, I'm going to figure out if I love Jesus over here. I'm, I'm going to determine that. And I do love Jesus. And I, I love what he has to say. And I love everything about him and his demeanor. And I just, I, 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 I love uh, what he says. I, I, I love Jesus. And then I got that. And that's probably going to be good enough. And then I come over here and I'm like, okay, now I got to decide whether I'm going to like obey him or not. Like, what am I going to obey? I don't like that. The culture doesn't like that. I won't do that. This is too hard. I, I don't like that. I really don't like that person, so I'm going to ignore these. Like, so then we come over here and we begin to cut and paste, right? Like, somehow these are separate conversations. And Jesus just says, no, actually, they're, they're just one conversation. Um, love and obedience are the, the same, you know, the opposite sides of the same coin. They're, they're like a plant that has root, that's love, and a flower, and that's obedience, but it's, it's just one plant. You, you can't separate it. You can't distinguish it. It's... It's just one thing. It's, it's both and continually. I think obedience sometimes and gets a sour taste in our mouths. We, we think about it uh, and, and it, it, it carries a connotation of, of just being like under the thumb of or having to. Like we, we take our dogs to obedience class, right? Like... There's this sense of just slavery and, and just all this thing heaped up on top of us. And so obedience has this bad taste, this bad connotation. And, and the reality is, is when it's defined like that, it's actually just being defined by the world and our own flesh. Because both want to rebel. And so when we look at obedience like that, we're actually looking at it in an opposite and ugly way. There's a, a biblical perspective of obedience, and, and uh, I'm not sure who said this. I know it wasn't me, but it says this, that obedience is the visible expression of love toward God. The visible expression of love toward God. It's what is seen from what is unseen. It's a word that's actually used of Jesus, which changes the conversation for me. It says that he was obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And so... If Jesus is having a conversation about obedience with me, it's only because he also is operating out of obedience and that obedience to the Father rises from his tremendous love. I want you to listen to 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Did you hear that? Uh, not burdensome, not heavy, not restricting. Why? Why are his commandments not burdensome? Because if you love Jesus and you're indwelt by the Spirit, you realize that, that what Jesus is calling you to, you realize that all of Scripture is a conversation that Jesus is having about how to engage in a path of blessing, in, in a path of, of life, in a path of joy, in a path of fulfillment and, and fullness. Like, you, you understand that what he's laying out is, is for our good and for the glory of God and for the good of everybody else around us. Like, that's what this is. But, but when you don't love Jesus, that's not what this is. It's a bunch of rules and it's a bunch of regulations and a bunch of things that hold you back. But when you love Jesus, you understand that, that these are the things that bring blessing and intimacy, closeness, the, the manifested presence of God in your life. This, this obedience, this walking in this path is what brings that. And then when you taste that, you want more of it. You desire that. And no matter how hard life gets, you, you hold on to that because you know that this is better. What he offers is better. It's a, it's a shift from I have to to I get to. From I need to to I want to. From, man, I really am not going to, don't want to, have no desire to forgive that person to, ah, I get to forgive them. I get to forgive them. I, I want to forgive them because I know what comes with that. This is the statement. This is the cry of David in the Psalms. Oh, how I love your law. Let me share a quote with you from A.W. Pink. He says, two things are true of every Christian. Deep down in his heart, there is an intense, steady longing and yearning to please God, to do his will, 
to walk in full accord with his word. This yearning may be stronger in some than in others, and in each of us it is stronger at some times than others. Nevertheless, it's there. But in the second place, no real Christian fully realizes this desire. Every genuine Christian has to say with the Apostle Paul, not as though I had already attained, either we're already perfect, but I follow after that I may lay hold of that for which I am laid hold of by Christ. He says that in us, there's this desire, there's this longing, there's this hunger. But this passage, this little statement, also carries an exhortation, a, a conviction, a, a gut check moment. For me, it's like an MRI. You know, my, my knee's not working quite right. I can see stuff's not working right on the outside. But then when I go in and take an MRI, it shows me what's happening on the inside. This little short statement of Jesus sort of feels like that to me sometimes. Like, I got to look at what I'm doing. I got to look at my lifestyle. I got to look at the decisions I'm making because that's going to discern my heart. And that's somewhat accurate, but, but somewhat also really, it's inaccurate because it doesn't actually help us to understand how we receive this, how it, how it comes at us when we're looking at it in terms of our own heart and our own actions. We know in relational reality that um, no matter how many times I say that I love my wife, she's going to define that love or whether I do based on how I act toward her. I could say I love her 35 times a day. I could send emojis. I could, I could blanket her with flowers. I could send I love you toward her all the time. But she will discern how much I love her based on how I live toward her, how I speak toward her, how I seek to bless her, how I seek to serve her and honor her, how I treat her out in public, how I communicate with her, how I embrace her, how I get the dishes done when she comes home super tired. She understands how I love her, whether my heart loves her based on how I live toward her, not just simply about what I say. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying the very same thing. He's saying that, that we who say that we love him but also then show that in the way that we live toward him. It's a natural outflow of the believer, but it's something that, that we just need to think about, that I, I just really want to hold on to. Listen to what Ezekiel says in chapter 33, 31. He it says this. It's, it's the international standard version. It says, Then they come to you as a group. Sit down. Right in front of you as if they were my people. Hear your words. And then don't do what you say because they're seeking only their own desires and they keep following their own self-interests. Or what Jesus says in Luke 6, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things I say? See, the, the tension is not looking at the activities of my life strictly and saying, I need to follow the rules, I need to keep the rules, I need to keep the rules in order to prove my love to God. The, the tension is actually, am I showing up at church on Sunday morning for an hour of heaven and singing, I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you and then going out and living like hell for the rest of the week. See, the tension is, am I, am I speaking the words that are living in contrast or that are in contrast to the way that I'm living? Or is my heart already devoted, loving Jesus, and I am in pursuit of the things that he calls me to do. That's where the tension lies. The tension lies really in, is it lips or is it reality? And Jesus says, if it's just lips, you don't love me. If you don't love me, I'm not with you. If I'm not with you, the Spirit's not with you. There's no eternal life. 
That's the reality of what he's saying. It's a moment for me just to check and say, okay, where's my heart? Does my heart love Jesus? Am I set with him? Does my heart love his word? Do I dig in because I want to know how to walk in his goodness and in his path and to experience his presence in my life? That's the exhortation I want to leave us with this morning. To take some time and to think about how do you act toward your wife? What does she believe about what you say? How do we live in this world? How does our life styles, the decisions we make, the, the ways that we treat one another within the church, the way that we act out in the world, the things that we pursue, where we place our resources. Um, how do those things let other people know who we love? I'll just close in prayer. Father, we thank you for the reality that for all who have come to faith in your son, you are with us. And you walk with us. And we can know that you are present in our lives. The, the real manifestation spiritually that, that lets us know that, that you're here. And that you lead us. And Father, I pray that you would kindle a hunger and a desire in your church to love your word, Lord Jesus, like we love you and to walk in obedience. Not just because we know that it's great and good for us, but, but because it brings glory to you and because, oh man, this world just needs to, to see a people who love and obey. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great rest of your day.